I'd like to introduce Paul Gunderson. Paul's with Dakota Precision Egg Center. And I, I think as everybody knows, in the Midwest, uh, egg is, uh, is, our, is our number one commodity um, in so many different areas. And I think uh, you're gonna enjoy the presentation that Paul's gonna have about the egg industry and, uh, and how drones and, and uh, um, autonomous vehicles could impact uh, their industry as well. So um, I'll let uh, Paul get on with his presentation. Thanks for coming down, Paul, appreciate it. All right, good morning, everyone. Thanks for being here. Let me also introduce a colleague right off of the uh, starting gate here. Uh, Mr. Nowoski, John Nowoski is at the back of the room. Raise your hand, John, John is at NDSU. Uh, has been uh, deeply involved in uh, this whole environment as well. Um, okay, mention was made earlier this morning. Producers are used, ag producers are very accustomed to using data. That's what they do. They've been collecting data about their fields and their combine yield monitors for well over 20 years. They're accustomed to looking at satellite imagery of their fields, of their farmsteads. All of that is digitized data, which is converted in the computer monitor, the computer screen, to a picture that you and I recognize with our bare eyes. They're accustomed to using those forms of technology, those forms of data, in order to make good decisions about their agricultural enterprises. So I begin with the observation Everything you hear today that may pertain to production agriculture is understood to function under the rubric of precision. And what we're trying to do in the agricultural world is maximize the genetic potential of the crops or the livestock that we are currently working with. We've got a lot of potential built in there we're not maximizing all of it. For instance, we all know in the ag agronomic world that at the moment, there's enough genetic potential in the corn that we seed to greatly exceed the yield objectives that we currently have. In fact, it's way over the top of what we're currently producing. What that tells us is that everything else we do needs to be maximized uh, in, a very, uh, in a very helpful way. And as I look across the room, let me introduce a colleague of mine, Dr. Kathleen Rook has just arrived from uh, Lake Region State College, Devil's Lake, where she drove from this morning. Thank you, and I hope you have the surface with you to operate these things. We don't need it now. We'll do it later. But um, at any rate, that's where we're at. Okay. The topic this morning is autonomous operation. Let me start also with another observation, and that is that autonomous in ag means much more than what we have here. It spans a continuum from taking humans out of hazardous operations, allowing those operations to continue with automated functional control of that technology, all the way to what we have with unmanned aerial systems. This happens to be what's called a quadcopter. There are other forms, fixed wing as well. Uh, we didn't bring any of those with, knowing what we uh, had by way of environment here. Okay, so autonomous in ag is a whole range of things. It is true that to some extent the public has become enamored with what we have here. But that's the public side. The producer side always begins with the observation, what do I need to maximize my capability to raise the crops and the livestock that I'm empowered to raise? What do I need? And the answer then is what dictates what I will purchase and the kind of technology that I'm going to put on my farm. I may decide ultimately that what I really want to do is automate field operations. We do have manufacturers who are working very di di diligently on producing that kind of technology. Last fall, for the first time, we had a manufacturer from Iowa up here uh, testing the ability of grain carts, those large structures that haul grain from the threshing combine to a park truck or into a grain bin. S there were uh, several of those that were operated from the combine cab. No operator in the tractor in front of that grain 
cart. All of that was being regulated from a combine cab, the harvester. So we have those kinds of technologies in front of us. Later today, and certainly during the exhibits tomorrow, you'll see some other examples of automated technology for removing grain out of grain storage structures, for perhaps working in confined space if we need to move waste products, we need to move feed for livestock, we need to move seed, those kinds of things, uh, then there are applications for autonomously operated and controlled technology. Producers are accustomed to this kind of technology because, as I mentioned earlier, they have been using, at least some of them, autonomous, data, autonomous technology and that technology is mounted on satellites that rotate this earth. It's that entire array of technology that is now in tractor and combine and all other forms of agricultural equipment that permits producers to remain right on target and to plant their crops with precision. That's an important development because it results in savings of several different types. But as we think about all of that, it's important to recognize that the transition within agricultural production to this kind of technology or the other form of quadcopter that you have over there is a relatively painless one with one caveat. I've never had a producer tell me, you know, Paul, I just don't have enough to do. They're all short of time. And that's an important caveat because for producers, there's a steep, there has been a steep learning curve as the newer forms of technology are deployed in their agricultural operation. We'll get back to that in just a moment or two. Okay, one other comment as we get going this morning, and that's what, I need to respond to the question, what can producers do at this point? First of all, with a rare exception, all agricultural operations are defined by the Federal Aeronautics Administration as commercial. That means they have to have one of two things. They either have to have a 338 exemption that they have applied for and been granted. That exemption, amongst other things, assures the FAA that the equipment they're using is airworthy that it has some basic capability on it, and those capabilities are increasing as uh, time goes along, and the FAA knows where they're going to be operating. The other way they can go is to file for a certificate of authorization, which essentially does some of the same thing and has a more expanded capability in terms of geographically where they can operate. Producers have to do that. Now, the reason for that is because as they fly, they're going to be using the imagery for commercial business purposes. The other thing that the FAA has correctly recognized is that if I'm flying technology of this kind, my aircraft may not be the only aircraft in that airspace. The railroads are flying aircraft manned, typically, to monitor rails. The same holds true for the pipeline companies through the farm that Paul and Harriet, my wife, own. We have four pipelines running through one corner, and um, we will often see primarily helicopter, manned helicopter technology, monitoring the, the right-of-ways, monitoring performance of the pipelines. Crop dusters operate on agricultural terrain. They're applying products which protect crops or which fertilize crops, provide nutrients for the crops to grow. So there's other aircraft operating in the same vicinity. That's why it's important to fly legally and to fly under an authorization from the Federal Aeronautics Administration. Having said that, let me now move to some of the ways in which we believe this kind of technology can be used across time. First of all, as was mentioned earlier this morning, two different types. There's the fixed wing type, and then there's the quadcopter type. The fixed wing has a lot of advantages. 
including the fact that from a business model perspective, it makes a lot more sense once authorization has been given to use it. It flies higher typically. It flies much faster. Its image capability is vaster by far in terms of width of image that it is creating. It has much longer battery life in part because the system, the DC system which drives that aircraft is more efficient than with a quad. So there are real advantages to using that type of technology and uh, let's see, I think RDO will be this afternoon demonstrating here, assuming they arrive, using that kind of technology. They're one of our larger agricultural equipment dealerships uh, across Minnesota and North Dakota. We began with this kind of technology largely because it's easier to fly. That may sound strange because that's the opposite of manned aircraft, but this is easier. The fixed wing requires more training, in part because with fixed wing technology, one has to ensure that one can control for stalls. You know, as a trained pilot, I think I spent at least 70% of my time dealing with stalls. Some of that on approach to landing, some of that on takeoff, the rest of it ongoing in flight. Why? Because fixed wing aircraft is subject to stalling. The same holds true for the unmanned aerial systems. They will stall out as well. And if I have paid $41,000 at the moment for a Precision Hawk fixed wing aircraft, a grown man will drop to tears in a moment when he watches that thing go into a stall and he can't recover from the stall because he's never been trained. That's why ground school is so important and the current or a proposed FAA regulations for operation of all of this technology require that the operator operating commercially go through ground school training. So the same training that I will receive as a licensed pilot of piloted aircraft will in some measure also be deployed in terms of ground school training for operators of this technology. That is likely going to significantly limit the extent to which this kind of technology will be used by an individual producer. But it won't limit the application of this technology in agriculture because what we expect to happen is that the same agricultural service industry such as a local agricultural co-op or a local agronomy dealer will eventually get to the point where they hire someone who has been trained to operate this technology and they now fly over 40 farms or 100 farms or more. And at that point, the business model makes a lot more sense in terms of what they're covering. Okay, so just a few things about now the ag arena. First of all, you'll see that the two technologies look very different. This is kind of the standard model, not the camera, but the actual airframe as we call it, this white area, or in this case, the black area. This is a standard Phantom, and you can pick them up not for use in ag, but in other arenas for roughly $400 and up, something that actually works reasonably well. Uh, or you can go the ruggedized version, which is like this. Uh, that's quite a bit more expensive, but that gets me to the first point. In agricultural operations, we don't want wires hanging out all over the place, driving the DC motors, which are the rotors propelling the props. We don't want wires hanging out of the body. And the reason for that is that we need to be able to fly this technology in rain. Yesterday I was in the Turtle Mountains, I wasn't using this technology, but as we left, it was snowing heavily up there. If I had a livestock operation I needed to check on, I've got to have technology that can fly. Stuff like that with the wires hanging out, no, no. That's about as much sense in an agricultural operation as me trying to perform my own appendectomy. It just doesn't make any sense. That's why in the ag world, a lot of this stuff is not yet ready for agricultural use. It's got to be ruggedized. Got to have very, very fixed types of capability 
in terms of the mounts. The DC motors, each one of these DC motors, by the way, was changed out by me, and a more powerful DC motor was installed. I've got to have replacement props. These are balanced, by the way, and we have a little balancer we use so that if we hit something, and we sometimes do, this one, for instance, was being demonstrated uh, in a school gymnasium, and uh, don't you suppose that all of a sudden it was under a steel roof? And when we use global positioning systems to guide this technology, there's a global unit right in here. Under steel roofs, they don't behave very well. So instead of flying forward, it decided to fly backward into the, uh, into the basketball backboard. Well, that's kind of an owie when that happens. And so the rear end here has been banged up a couple of times, and we had to replace the camera. There's a little camera right there. We have three cameras on this unit, one here in front, one underneath, one over here. Um, you can mount various miniaturized cameras so they work quite well in this kind of a technology so long as you keep track of the images, okay? Got to be ruggedized for agricultural use because I may decide to use this technology in a barn. We've already flown this one right through the trusses, the structure that holds the rafters. It, assuming that the GPS system is working correctly, I can fly within a half inch of a fixed object and I'm doing just fine. That means that if I want to check on the cattle, particularly if I have for a whole holding facility for that dairy operation or for that beef operation. And as we get to the point where these technologies will automatically dock and take off. That's the next step. In agricultural use, that's the only thing that'll work. This notion that we have to throw it or that it has to take off from the uh, pickup bed or the ground, that's, that's utterly nonsense. That's, you know, that's like using old, old tractor technology that won't work. in that kind of environment. If I'm responsible for a feedlot where cattle are being fed, I can use this technology to monitor the feed bunks. I can check the extent to which those feed bunks are penetrated at night by coon, by skunk, um, possibly by coyotes. And you know, when coyotes get into, and, and coon particularly, get into cattle feed, they make a mess. Because the first thing they gotta do is urinate on it then it's better to eat. Cattle don't like that. So then that food is spoiled and wasted. Well, the better way to do that is to keep all of that kind of stuff out of the feedlot. You can check on that when you use technology like this. Now going to the other standard unit like this, we ordered this one with uh, battery technology. You want to hold that battery for a moment? Feel heavy? Yeah. These are battery technologies explicitly engineered to power this kind of a unit. Sliding right in, coupled in, and there we are. This unit has been ruggedized for agricultural use, though it's not as nice as we would like. First of all, the feet are too short. If I try to land this one with this extraordinarily sensitive camera, and I try to land in a cornfield, what's going to happen? The corn stalk sticking up from the ground will tip it over. Well, that's a no-no, because now we gotta walk out there wherever it is. If it's almost at the end of line of sight, a quarter mile up the field, that's kind of an owie and tip it right up again so that it will take off on its own. So we've got to have longer legs on it. But other than that, first of all, ruggedized DC motors, larger than what one would typically get if you went to Radio Shack or you ordered online somewhere for the technology. Ruggedized props so that if we happen to hit some foliage in a field or something like that, they're not going to serrate and cut up the edges. Very ruggedized frame all the way through. And you'll see, except for the camera technology, we don't have any wires hanging out anywhere. 
Uh, theoretically, this one could be used in inclement weather, though we haven't because of the price of the camera. Mention was made earlier this morning about cameras, and that's the next thing I'll turn to uh, as we go through. This unit is outfitted with what's called a GroPro camera technology. That's the camera technology that looks at all images and produces it just like our normal eyes would. So you see normal blue, you see normal green, you see normal yellow, you see a normal brown, etc. Most of the technology available to a hobbyist is GroPro, and that's okay for that purpose. Its uses, though, in production ag are somewhat limited. So here's what we do when we go into the production environment. First of all, producers who are accustomed to using satellite imagery to produce zone technology of their fields so that they can vary the application of, of uh, fertilizer or other nutrients in their fields. Those producers who are accustomed to seeing that will be looking at what's called either multispectral or hyperspectral imagery. That is imagery which specifically targets very specific bands of light. How many of you have taken physics? Any of you enrolled in physics at the moment? Okay. But some of you may have been reading about spectral imagery. It's specific bands. And the number of bands exceeds 600. That's an important observation. Because in agriculture, in agriculture fields, specific fields, produce very specific colors. So if I'm growing soybeans, I'm looking for the bands of color that are relevant for soybeans, and that means the leaves. And I'm looking at those colors because those leaves will tell me whether that plant is diseased, whether that plant is short of moisture, whether that plant is working with excess moisture, whether the plant is short of essential nutrients. That's what I'm looking for. With this kind of a camera, this is a hyperspectral camera, I can image virtually all of that. Lens here on the bottom. Very wide angle of view, everything electronically. In case you're wondering, this is about 18,000 for this camera. Okay? Yeah. That's why we don't like dropping it in a feedlot in a bunch of manure. We don't like dropping it in the field if we can avoid it, although it has landed several times in fields. But it's kind of tough on it without, you know, more by way of legging here that would outfit it for agriculture. So, in terms of camera technology, if I'm going to monitor livestock and cattle, a grow pro will do it. I can pick up on the color of the eyeballs, I can kind of watch the fur, I can detect whether the individual livestock type has been injured. Even if I'm involved in a horse operation, I may discover that monitoring horses on pasture or in fields um, could be very important. Okay, power source. This is one of the big price differentials, differences in what you will spend if you try to purchase this technology for your own purpose. This, $189 for this battery. This one, 68 This one goes in the smaller of the two units. So there's a big difference in power capability that's available at this point in time for use in this technology. I'm going to stop for a moment before I go on. Any questions? Well, yeah. Yes, the question is, couldn't you fix some other kind of camera? And you're exactly right. There are numerous cameras that are available. One of the um, differences between this kind of technology and this is the t cameras for this have to be tailored to fit it. For this one, we have two things under here. First of all, we have what's called a gimbal that works like a gyroscope, and it helps to keep this aircraft positioned correctly so that the images aren't distorted so much by tilting forward and back side to side. Then there's a standard mount. So I could go out online 
and I could order from any number of camera fabricators a different kind of a camera. I can put a $300 camera on it, a $198 camera, a GoPro camera, and then I get up to the spectral imagery where it's much more expensive. Okay, now that reminds me, any other questions? Why would we worry about stable platforms? The reason for that is that as we fly, and this unit, by the way, will fly in winds up to 30 knots, and we can mostly control it. That means roughly 21, 22 mile an hour winds. That's important out here in the high plains because it's windy much of the time. But as I fly, if my camera is right here, I will discover that this thing in the wind will want to move around. And as it does so, the image that results is somewhat distorted. Now I need to fit all of those images together so they cover the terrain I'm trying to image. All of that fitting together, that imagery can take a lot of time. Let me just cite one example. I um, flew this one last summer on my own property. I couldn't use what I was, the imagery for any decision making. That would have been a violation of uh, the authorized use. I could use it for purposes of checking on what it was going to take to what's called ortho-rectify the images. That means fitting all of the images together. Now as I do that, I can fly 160 acres, that's a quarter section, I can cover that in about an hour, maybe a little bit more or less, depending on how many battery changes and how much wind I'm flying in. That's quite a bit of time. Now I've got something along the lines of three to possibly up to nine gigabytes of data. Anyone know how much that is? Yeah, that's a pile of data. A huge pile. Now I've got to sit at my computer and visually fit all of that imagery together. As I flew last summer and I was flying in heavy wind, no fun in losing money. I like growing crops and I like growing crops that permit me to cash flow. That means I'm going to make a profit of some kind. Okay? So I've got to be able to acquire technology and use it that doesn't require a lot of time. That's why producers probably are going to discover for the most part, though they might have a fantasy from their childhood of flying aircraft, for the most part might be using this as a hobby, but they're probably going to pay someone to capture the imagery they actually need in order to make a business decision. Okay? And that's why we have the gimbal under here, is to help us correct a lot of that distortion, get rid of it at the time we take the picture. So we don't have to go back afterwards and correct it all. We still have to do it, but we can remove a lot of stuff by virtue. So if you're going to be interested in really good photographic quality of your imagery, and I'm sure some of you here are, if you are, make sure you order technology that has a gimbal, either on the frame or above the camera, so that you have that stability and the software that you will use will automatically help you correct for all of that. Okay, now that gets me to the, to the next item I just briefly wanted to cover before I end this morning, and that's the data thing. Agricultural producers are accustomed to using a lot of data, but boy, this does this generate data. And it generates so much that two things happen. Nine gigabytes of data is more than what most farm or ranch computers in North Dakota in their business office can handle. So now what do I do? I've got to go up to the cloud. That means I have to have an agricultural subscription to a cloud provider, and that provider has to be capable not only of housing this data, but housing the software that allows me to manipulate the data and create the imagery and the decision-making capability that I need as an agricultural producer. So data becomes a huge issue. 
And in fact, in the final analysis, when all is said and done, how the data is going to be handled makes much more sense than this particular type of technology that I'm going to use. Even though most of us in the autonomous world are still kind of transfixed. We're intrigued by all of this stuff. We can handle it. We can hold it. We can touch it. Can't do that with data. That's pretty hard. We can look at it at the end, and we can hold it on the sheets of paper if we print it out, but that's about it. So people get excited about all of this, but in the egg world, that's not good enough. That's not even close. What we have to have is good data that informs our decisions so that everything we do maximizes the genetic potential of the livestock or the crops that we're raising. Okay, with that, I'm ending. Any questions? Yes. Since I'm hard of hearing by virtue of riding in tractor cabs, What if, if moisture? Okay. The question is, what would happen if dirt got on these wires, or what would happen perhaps if manure, cattle urine, rain, snow, whatever? Well, it kind of depends on what those wires are doing. First of all, the wires themselves are covered. But it's the couplings that allow moisture to enter, or oil would be another one on a farm operation. And typically what happens is it shorts out. Then it, that means that the electrical current has crossed both the negative and the positive poles here. And at that point I've got a problem because now I have to start troubleshooting to try to figure out why it won't work. And even troubleshooting this technology is a bit of a problem because there's quite a bit of technology here to troubleshoot. Yes? Okay, the question is what happens if that happens? Do you have to buy another one or can you repair it? Well, that'll, that'll kind of depend first of all on the kind of equipment you have. Is that the question? The kind of equipment you have that is available. If you've got a, an electrical bench at home in your garage, your basement, whatever, and you've got some testing tools there, you can check for things like continuity, does the power flow, you can check to determine whether it's flowing on the positive side, are the negative grounds working the way they should. You can work through virtually all of that. The parts are readily available. You can go on the web and you can find everything. Change out in the motors. Here, by the way, is the GPS receiver right on this unit. I can change that out, order a different kind, couple it right here. So there are a number of things that I can do by ordering parts. They are repairable. If you fracture this, however, then you might as well buy a new one. The question is, is there any way one of these can explode? The only th way that would happen would be if you had a defective power pack in here and the power pack itself would explode. But other than that, no. Should be no way. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? No? All right. Well, thank you. Let's give Paul a hand. Thank you very much.